As Paul is writing to the Philippians, he is writing from prison. And the Philippians are rather dismayed, disheartened over the fact that the Apostle Paul is in prison. And so he writes to them with the thought of encouraging them in their faith. And in particular, that they might rejoice even during this time of his imprisonment. Well, the question is, why in the world would the Philippians be rejoicing at the thought of the Apostle Paul being in prison? Well, he gives a number of reasons. Last week, we saw that the reason they were to rejoice is because the imprisonment of the Apostle Paul was not going to hinder the gospel. In fact, it was actually going to advance the gospel. But then the question is, well, what does it mean for the Apostle Paul himself, what he is going through? How should they view the difficulties that he is encountering by being in prison? So Paul writes that there is cause for rejoicing is in the way that uh, God is ministering to Paul even in the time of his imprisonment. Paul writes that he is assured at this time that God is going to grant him deliverance. The key verse is Philippians 1.19. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. So this evening we want to look at the Apostle Paul's being delivered even in the time of his imprisonment. First, Paul is confident that he will experience deliverance from his imprisonment. Philippians 1.19. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Now, as we look at this word deliverance, and uh, some translations translate it salvation, uh, deliverance is a good thought here, uh, for it's not talking about salvation in a soteriological sense. It's not talking about the salvation of his soul, but it's talking about the deliverance in his experience. And that deliverance could be quite broad. It could refer to his release from imprisonment, or it could talk about the end of the imprisonment concerning uh, his life on earth and actually being in the presence of God. And we'll expound upon that more fully in just a, a few moments. But we want to look at the confidence, first of all, for his being delivered. Why is he so sure that he's going to be delivered? Well, he gives two reasons. The first is his confidence is based on the prayers of the Philippians, Philippians 1.19. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out to my deliverance. So their prayers. Paul is confident that God is going to hear and answer the prayers of the Philippians. Now that gives us great hope and cause for uh, the importance of prayer. In the book of James, it says that we have not because we ask not. It also goes on to say that the effectual prayers of a righteous man avails much. So here we have this valuable lesson on the prayers benefit for the Philippians, that their prayers are actually going to be effectual before God, that they're going to be beneficial that as they pray for Paul, he's going to experience deliverance. And so that teaches us that we ought to be praying for people in adversity and times of their hardships and difficulties, believing that God is going to deliver them as well. And then secondly, his confidence is based upon the Lord's help. For it says in verse 19, For I know that through your prayers, and then this, and the help of the Spirit, of Jesus Christ. This will turn out for my deliverance. The Spirit of God will be at work in this situation. He's confident of that because the Philippians are praying. He's confident of that because of the grace of God. The Spirit of God can change the attitude of his captors. The Spirit of God can change the Apostle Paul's attitude as well. But this provides a basis for rejoicing. Later in this same book, in Philippians chapter 4, Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. 
Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So he believes that through their prayers, God is going to keep his heart and his mind, that God is giving him peace in the midst of all that he's encountering. The primary deliverance that Paul is anticipating is going to result in an ability to glorify God, whether it be in his life or in his death. He is expecting to be delivered from being ashamed at having failed in his allegiance to Christ. For it tells us in verse 20, As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed. Paul is confident that whatever he experiences, whether it be in life or in death, that he is not going to be ashamed. Ashamed of the gospel. Ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ashamed of the way in which he conducts himself. Because he believes that God is going to give him the grace to handle whatever it is that he is going to encounter. Later in Philippians 4, 13, Paul writes, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul's going to be able to face whatever situation he's experiencing with deliverance. God will keep him from being ashamed and will grant him courage, whether it be in life or in death. Verse 20, it says, As is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Courage to continue to name the name of Christ. Courage not to deny the Lord and exchange uh, his testimony for freedom. Not to compromise his faith in any way. He is confident that in the future, that even now, that God will give him full courage. And then these words, now as always. The Apostle Paul had been through many difficult times in the past, and God has delivered him in each of those situations. God has enabled the Apostle Paul to remain strong, committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he believes that this is not going to be an exception, that God will continue to give him that courage and that strength to be able to bear up under anything that he is going to encounter. So Paul shares with the Philippians his view of life and death, for he says in verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Then Paul unpacks what that means, to live is Christ and to die is gain. To live for Christ means that he will faithfully serve God as long as he lives. Verse 22 if I am to live in the flesh, that means faithful labor for me. Paul says, as long as I'm in this body, as long as I am experiencing physical life, I am going to continue in laboring for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now again, that's not arrogance on his part. That is not speaking of his innate strength, but the courage that he will receive as a result of their prayers and the working of the Spirit of God. He will have fruitful labor as long as he lives. And then he goes on to say, and to die is gain, for it is going to be this opportunity to be with Christ in verse 23. Uh, I am hard-pressed uh, for uh, to be between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. So Paul talks about uh, a dilemma that he is in, an emotional dilemma, and that is which would be better for Paul, to live 
or to die. He said, it's hard for me to choose between the two, in verse 22. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. Why in the world would Paul say that he can't choose between which is better, life or death? Why is it so hard for him to choose? Well, the reason is that for him personally, death would be better than life, verse 23. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. It is better than life. It is better to be with the Lord. In fact, he says it is far better, that the two cannot even be compared. The two cannot even be prepared. So we ask the question, why is it far better for Paul to be in the Lord's presence than to continue on in this life? Is it simply because then he'll be free from pain and suffering? Is it simply because his imprisonment will have come to an end, that he will no longer experiencing the hardships that are associated with that imprisonment? You know, oftentimes we think of people and their adversity and their hardship and their suffering, and we say, well, they're better off. Uh, At least now their suffering and their pain is over, and they're in the presence of the Lord. But we struggle with people who die young in age or those that are uh, pain-free and yet they die and, and go into God's presence. Sometimes we wonder if they've missed out, if their life has been cut short, if they have experienced some kind of uh, untoward circumstance that is regrettable. Well, Certainly we miss anyone who has died, and for us, we would love to have them in our presence. But if we asked anyone who went to be with the Lord if they'd want to come back, the answer would be no. For to live is Christ, to die is gain. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior, no matter what you are experiencing in this life, it is always a gain to be in the presence of God. Paul doesn't talk about an ease from suffering. He doesn't talk about a deliverance from imprisonment. What he talks about is being with Christ, being with Christ. That is what is far better. The best day of our lives cannot be compared to the average day in heaven. It is far better superior. So Paul's not afraid to die. In fact, he, in some ways, is looking forward to be in the presence of Christ. And yet he finds it hard to decide which would be better, to remain in this life or to be with with Christ. So why would it be better to remain? Well, Philippians 1.24 tells us why. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Why would it be necessary? Well, he speaks of their progress in the faith in verse 25, convinced of this. I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. The Philippians needed to develop in their faith. They needed to understand more fully that which God was doing in them and through them. They needed to continue to grow. And so Paul says that uh, for their continued growth, he is convinced that God is going to deliver him from this imprisonment physically and that he is going to be able to continue to minister to them because they need him. There is still so much more to show them. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all, convinced of your need. As we think about that particular aspect of this passage, the application is that it is comforting for us to know that as long as we are truly needed, that we can anticipate that we'll be able to continue to serve and live out our life on this earth. That should be a wonderful 
peace of mind for us as we think about our families, as we think about our ministries, as we think of all that we are involved with and all the people that we encounter. We can be assured that we will continue just as long as we are absolutely needed, absolutely needed. So we don't have to worry about our families. We don't have to worry about ministries, but we can continue as long as we are absolutely needed. And if we die, it means that by God's grace, our spouses, our children, our work will continue. That God will supply. That that which we supply will be replaced by his grace. And so they will be sufficient. They will be able to continue on. Paul writes here that he is convinced that he's going to live. When he writes in 2 Timothy, Paul again is in prison, this time not expecting to be released from prison. And he writes to Timothy, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. In that situation, Paul knows that his work is completed. I have finished my course. And, of course, the Lord had enabled him to keep the faith. But we can be assured that God is going to enable us right to the end of our lives, if we are praying and relying upon the Spirit of God, that we will remain faithful to him and that our work will be done. And then we can enter into the presence of God. Fourthly, Paul is reasonably certain that he will not suffer death as the outcome of his imprisonment. Philippians 1.25 says, Convinced of this, that is, that his work is necessary for their progress in the faith, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all, that by God's grace they are going to continue to grow in reference to their faith through the work and ministry of the Apostle Paul, verse 25, for your progress and joy in their faith. That their relationship to Paul will be an occasion to give glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, in verse 26, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus. That is in relationship to the Apostle Paul. As they think about Paul's life, they'll be able to rejoice and give glory to Christ for three things. First, the faithfulness of Paul, that he continues to serve despite his imprisonment, that he continues to labor, that he ultimately will be released and be in their presence and again continue to serve. Secondly, they can rejoice in their answers to prayer as they've been praying for the Apostle Paul. They'll be able to see him and see that God indeed answered the prayers that they had offered and how he had been strengthened and helped. And then third, they're going to be able to rejoice in their growth in grace. They're going to see that this imprisonment has indeed furthered the gospel, and this imprisonment has served to be a buoy to their faith, that it will not have undermined the faith of the Philippians, but actually it will increase. They're going to rejoice that Paul will minister to them personally again. Verse 26, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Conclusion. What are some of the takeaways from this passage? Well, first of all, we can be assured in times of adversity that through the prayers of others and the supply of the Spirit of God, that God will enable us to glorify him even in the time of adversity, whether that be in life or in death. We can have that confidence, not because of our strength, but of the strength that he will provide. Secondly, we can take great comfort in times of adversity when hardship strikes, that God is still watching over not only ourselves, but our loved ones and our ministry. 
that God will not allow anything to happen to us that is going to prove to be totally uh, disabilitating to our loved ones. But he will supply their need, sparing us for as long as we are absolutely needed. Thirdly, what we are doing for God is essential. That there is one sense in which we are needed. God is not limited by us, and yet God chooses to use his people. And as long as God chooses to use us, we're indispensable. That what we do is important, not only is important, but necessary. And so we should have a sense of great fulfillment and joy, knowing that our lives are not lived in vain, they're just not meaninglessly uh, hours pass, but what we do is important in the lives of others. However, when the time for our ministry, our work is done, God will take us to be with him, which is far better. So we can rejoice, whether it be in life or in death. In life, we can rejoice that we're living for the Lord Jesus. And we can pray and rely upon the Spirit of God to give us what we need of, to be able to face each and every day in a way that we're remaining faithful to God and being a blessing to others. And if we know the Lord Jesus Christ, we can say, to die is gain. For we will be in his presence, enjoying life with him forever and ever. So may God give us cause of rejoicing, even in the midst of hardship and adversity.